Good morning or afternoon or whatever time it is you've chosen to watch this pre-recording of uh, worship for St. Kennegan's Bearwood United. And actually anybody who wishes to watch is most welcome. This is known as uh, Lent 5. It's two weeks out from Easter. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And then, of course, Easter Day a week later. Uh, just to let you know, with all these services which I prepare, they have a threefold uh, set up to them or structure they have what we call an approach a word and a response in this we approach God to receive our worship or worship we hear the word and then we respond to it and so as we approach now in worship you may wish to light a candle at this point as a way of uh, centering yourself I have one lit here uh, so you may wish to pause uh, push pause at this point and then uh, find a candle and then come back. A good way to enter into a time of worship which I attempt to do when we are all together is to uh, enable a bit of time just for people just to center themselves and just to um, just to be still in the moment. So I have a few simple exercises at this point which I invite you to join in if you wish. If you are feeling a bit restless then and unable to easily relax, a way of entering into this time of worship could involve these four simple exercises. So let's begin first sitting in a chair, listening to the sounds both outside and inside. So we're just listening. Uh, there isn't much outside at the moment, of course. People are locked down, but inside us there could be different things going in, uh, going around our minds. While we're listening, we become conscious of our own breathing. As we listen, we hear the sound of our heart beating. And now let's become aware of the feeling of our bodies in our chairs. Now that you are more relaxed and perhaps have a candle in front of you to focus on, let's proceed through the service below, beginning with this call to worship. The call to worship is based on Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. We're going to continue to reflect now in our first hymn, Be Still, My Soul, and the link is provided or embedded into this uh, YouTube presentation for you today. And so our first hymn.
a beautiful hymn in which to reflect. Let us continue now in prayer. Let us pray. O God, source of life and source of love, though we are apart as a congregation, we still gather as your people to worship you. Isolated in our own homes, we are still your church, the people of St. Kindergarten, Burwood United. As we pray now, loving God, please look with compassion on this congregation, though scattered, as we come before you. Breathe into our humanity, loving God, that we may fully live. Breathe your spirit into our minds, that our decision making may be pure and wise. Breathe your spirit on our lips, that our speech may witness to life and light and holy joy. Breathe your spirit on our hands, that in their busyness they may serve you before all else. Breathe your spirit on our feet, that we may tread this earth with gentleness and respect. O God, in a time of quiet, we bring before you now all that of the last week and that which is on our mind. Loving God, you are our understander. You understand us more than we do. You know all our thoughts, feelings and motives. Guide us today and all our days. In your name we pray. Amen. Our second hymn, which we will continue to reflect in, is Brother Sister, Let Me Serve You. We come to our readings now, and the first today is from Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. And this is reading from the revised, or the new revised standard version. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me round among them. And behold, there were very many upon the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said to me, 
prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath into you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And as I looked, there were sinews upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath on them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great host. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost, we are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves, and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you home into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves, and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you will live. And I will place you in your own land, that you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken. And I have done it, says the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the, to the church. Thanks be to God. And now our second reading uh, this morning, or today, is from John 11, 1 to 45. And just to let you know, this is quite a long reading. So this is John 11, 1 to 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment, and wiped his head, his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness is not unto death, it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by means of it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this he said to the disciples, Let us go into Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were but now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Thus he spoke, and then he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awake him out of sleep. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told him plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary sat in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. 
Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying quietly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were, who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Then Mary, when she came where Jesus was, and saw him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I knew that thou hearest me always, but I have said this on account of the people standing by, that they may believe that thou didst send me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ the Word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your eyes, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, as I said before, good morning and welcome to today's reflection. Welcome to you whether you are with someone or on your own. And I hope that either way you are able to find enough resources to pass uh, through what is an unusual time and a long time, a month in self-isolation. The coronavirus itself is proving to be undoubtedly the greatest uh, existential threat the world has faced since World War II and the Cold War. Its potency and its contagiousness has given rise to remarkable actions by the government to slow its spread in New Zealand. And only uh, those of you with a long memory will be able to recall such intervention by a New Zealand government when faced with a threat like this. Consequently, as we know, we're now in the most extreme of those stages, a stage four lockdown with self-isolation only a week after the Prime Minister announced the four stages. As I've said in our services before, loneliness has been regarded as the greatest disease of the 21st century. Just for clarity, aloneness isn't necessary, necessarily the same as loneliness, but in this case we have been told that we must be alone in our family unit or bubble, and whomever constitutes that bubble. So for, her, so for some it is only them, and for others it might be like that large family I read about in the paper the other day. Self-isolation will no doubt compound loneliness for many. 
but this stage 4 lockdown is necessary for our own health and literal survival. Today, as we journey towards Easter in two weeks with Palm Sunday next week, we meet up with the essence of the Johannine signs or signs in John's Gospel. Different from the other three parallel Gospels, John's Gospel is distinguishable by its signs. It's pointing to other things, which is what a sign does. It points to something else. In this story of Lazarus today, we see this gospel pointing to Jesus' greatest claim, that he is the resurrection. In this story, he is called into the lives of ordinary people. He is called by two sisters, Mary and Martha, to save their brother Lazarus, who is dying. But he arrives too late. Now, grief is a strange thing. I've experienced it personally, as many of you no doubt have. I've also observed it for quite a while in others, in families and individuals, and in the community, particularly in the East of Christchurch. And what I've seen is that it cannot be tamed, and nor should it be. It is neither rational nor reasonable, because it is that most human of responses to someone we first loved. Prince William said it himself at Hagley Park three weeks after the February 20. Uh, 2011 earthquake. Grief is the price we pay for f having first loved someone. He should know with the loss of his own mother at a young age. In extreme grief, I have seen families kick holes and jib in the family home in anger. I've seen families refuse to talk to one another. With one family I visited in Wellington to prepare a funeral I met with the son in one room of the home and the daughter in another because they wouldn't talk to each other. And I've seen someone swear because they were too late on the scene and their father-in-law died before they got there. They later told me how ashamed they were at the bad language they used. We aren't told what Jesus says, but we do know that he is upset at being too late on the scene due to choosing to delay his trip. Couched in euphemistic language, we are told that Jesus is deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Mary and Martha have pleaded with him to come and save their brother. But by the time he gets there, having made other decisions to go elsewhere in the meantime, Lazarus has died. And Jesus is furious with himself. And so in his anger and his grief and his pain, he strides to Lazarus's tomb and commands him to come out. And as he does so, he becomes the resurrection. He becomes the new life. He becomes the unstoppable force. Leading to the proclamation in verse 18, I am the resurrection and the life. In this is the future come to the present. It's what the theologians call realized eschatology. The eschaton is the future realm. And with what we see here is the future and the now, the resurrection and the present, new life in the here and now. I read with interest the press's front page article yesterday, describing how plans are already being made for how New Zealand could look and function economically post level four isolation. The suggestion from the Minister of Finance is that we'll need to look more into ourselves as a nation. And while that might need to be the case economically for a while, what about us socially? For instance, there is a chance that many of those already shut in are receiving more phone calls than they usually might. What happens when the level four stage is lifted? Will contact with them drop off, even though they will be free to move about but less able to than many others? For us as a parish, already acutely aware of the parish's pastoral needs, will this change the way we go about pastoral care? When the level four restriction is lifted, we will be able to resume visiting one another. We will also be able to take the parish newsletter to those shut in. But at the moment, all we can do is make phone calls and use technology like this. For those without email, for instance, that is all they were receiving from us. 
I was taken aback to find out that I couldn't even hand deliver this service to those with an email, as I have to follow the directive from the National Church and not touch paper. This means that about half the congregation cannot access what you are able to access today. And so in terms of future-proofing our parish, in case this happens again, as it could come back in cycles as the Spanish flu did, do we embark on something like community IT courses for those without internet and email connection? We are in a hard space. Our country is, our world is. As with the psalmist in today's psalm number 130, we are in a pit. But the scriptures of our faith tell us that death is not the end, that there is a way out of the pit, that there is a way out of the tomb, that even in the desert of death described in Ezekiel today, life does not end there. God does live in us as we are promised in Romans 8 in having life in the spirit. The promise of the gospel is much greater than civil defences we will get through. The promise of the gospel transcends that in any human words. The promise of the gospel is that we are all made in God's image and patterned after the seasons. And so, as we know, after the winter, there is always the spring. Winter, death, does not have the final say. Spring, resurrection does. Let us hold on to that. Amen. And we reflect again in this hymn, God is our refuge and strength. As we begin our response now with the offering, we take this time to, uh, in silence, pray over that which we have given and which we can continue to give to each other, though uh, shut in by way of phone call or some other method of contact uh, at this time. Let us pray. 
O God, though we cannot gather to present our offerings to you, we offer ourselves as a gift to the world. May we, difficult though it is, appreciate this time to read, reflect and rejuvenate for the year ahead. In your name we pray. Amen. This brings us now to our prayers of thanks, of intercession and the Lord's Prayer. And much of this uh, prayer now is based uh, on the work of Bruce Pruer from the Uniting Church in Australia. And so let us pray again. We give thanks and we pray for uh, one another. We pray for our local and our wider community. Let us pray. We thank you, loving God, for the vulnerable yet wonderful gift of life. To be alive and to know it is an unspeakable honour. We thank you that from birth to growth and maturation and into decline and decay, our life is precious in your sight. We thank you, God of faithfulness, that our movement towards physical death and decay is not the final sentence in our story. We thank you that by faith we are born to a new and living hope in a future where love will never be terminated. We thank you, holy friend, that in death as in life, we are in the hands of a lover who knows our names and treasures our identity. We thank you for the authority given to Jesus of Nazareth to command the dead to move out of their tombs into greater life. We thank you that those who believe in him have already passed from death to life and are even now fed with the bread of heaven. We thank you that in our heavenly home there is room even for us. We're in an abundant life than we can ever imagine. We shall love you better and adore you eternally. Most holy friend, for this gift of resurrection life, defined by the very being of Christ Jesus, we give you thanks and praise this day and forever. And now as we pray for one another, we pray for other people. Source of life, God of love, let your salvation surround the living who walk under the shadow of death and the dead who are gloriously alive. Great Spirit, friend, come with your life and light. Be close to your dying children. By simple faith in your undying grace, may they have peace in the hour of their departing. Great Spirit friend, come with your life and light. Be close to people who are caught up in the rawness of a new grief. Enable them to weep well, free from bitterness or despair. Great Spirit friend, come with your life and light. Be close to all who care for the dying, in hospitals or at home, in a hospice or on a battlefield. Give them your quiet strength. Great Spirit friend, come with your life and light. Be close to ministers, priests and lay pastors who pray with the dying, minister last rites or sit holding a hand. Great Spirit friend, come with your life and light. Be close to those who fight against untimely death, those who spend their days working for the elimination of the coronavirus, AIDS, many diseases, the carnage on our highways and the butchery of warfare. Great Spirit friend, come with your life and light. Be close to the preachers of the gospel. Be with those with whom they find it difficult to proclaim your word. Enable them to find that inadequate words will take flesh and become powerful agents in helping people to begin living eternal life now. And now we pray the prayer left as a gift for us, praying, Our Father in heaven, holy be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not put us to the test, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we reflect in today's final hymn, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
And now as we conclude our worship today, God will bless you and keep you. The Spirit will smile upon you and be gracious unto you. The Christ will send his own light upon you and give you peace. Amen.